excerpted from the complete visions of and Catherine Emmerich. At the end, a prayer for the intercession of blessed and Catherine Emmerich. At Malop, Jesus delivered a long instruction at the fountain. He spoke again of the approach of the kingdom and of the obligation to go to meet it, of his own departure, and of the short time remaining to him, of the bitter consummation of his labors, and of the necessity they were under of following him and laboring with him. He alluded again to the speedy destruction of Jerusalem and the chastisement that would soon overtake all who rejected the kingdom of God, who would not do penance and amend their lives instead of clinging to their worldly goods and pleasures. Referring to the country in which they lived, where everything was so pleasant and the conveniences of life so many, Jesus compared it after all to an ornamented tomb whose interior was full of filth and corruption. Then he bade them reflect upon their own interiors and see what lay concealed under their beautiful exteriors. He touched upon their usury, their avarice, their desire to gain which led them to communicate so freely with the pagans, their violent attachment to earthly possessions, their sanctimoniousness, and he again told them that all the magnificence and worldly conveniences that they saw around them would one day be destroyed, that the time would come in which no Israelite would there be found living. He spoke very significantly of himself and the fulfillment of the prophecies, and yet only a few comprehended his words. During this instruction the people presented themselves in bands and by turns, old men, middle-aged men, youths, women, and maidens. All were deeply touched, they wept and sobbed. Jesus went next with some disciples and others a couple of hours to the east of Malop, to where the occupants of several farms had begged him to come and where he had already gone once before from Malop. There was, nearby, a shady hill that was used as a place for instruction. The disciple of Naim also had come hither from the port of Sidium, to make preparations for his departure from Cyprus. Jesus here, as at Malop, delivered a farewell discourse, after which he went around to some huts and cured several invalids who had begged him to do so. He had already set out on his return journey to Malop when an old peasant implored him to go to his house and take pity on his blind son. There were in the house three families of twelve persons, the grandparents, two married sons, and their children. The mother, veiled, brought the blind boy to Jesus in her arms. Although it could both speak and walk, Jesus took the child into his arms, with the finger of his right hand anointed its eyes with his own saliva, blessed it, put it down on the ground and held something before its eyes. The child grasped after it awkwardly, ran at the sound of its mother's voice, then turned to the father, and so from the arms of one to those of the other. The parents led it to Jesus, and weeping thanked him on their knees. Jesus pressed the child to his bosom and gave it back to the parents with the admonition to lead it to the true light, that its eyes, which now saw, might not be closed in darkness deeper than before. He blessed the other children also, and the whole family. The people shed tears and followed him with acclamations of praise. In the house used for such purposes at Malop, a feast was given, in which all took part. The poor were fed, and presents were given them. Jesus, finally, delivered a grand discourse on the word which, he said, was the whole summary of prayer. Whoever pronounces it carelessly, makes void his prayer. Prayer cries to God, binds us to God, opens to us his mercy, and with the word rightly uttered, we take the asked for gift out of his hands. Jesus spoke most forcibly of the power of the word he called it the beginning and the end of everything. He spoke almost as if God had by it created the whole world. He uttered and over all that he had taught them, over his own departure from them, over the accomplishment of his own mission, and ended his discourse by a solemn then he blessed his audience, who wept and cried after him. Jesus left Malop with his disciples, Barnabas and Nason following the next day. They left Kytrus to the right and went straight on across fields, through thickets, and over mountain ridges. Jesus attempted to discharge his indebtedness at the inn with the money brought him by the disciple from Naim. But when the proprietor refused to receive it, it was distributed to the poor. All those that, either at present or in the future, were from Malop, Kytrus, or Salamis to follow Jesus into Palestine were to go by different routes. One party was to cross over from a port northeast of Salamis, and others, who had business at Tyre, were to start from Salamis itself. The baptized pagans went, for the most part, to Jesser. Arrived at Salamis, 
Jesus and his followers put up at the school in which, upon his coming to Cyprus, he had sojourned. They entered from the northwest. The aqueduct lay to the right, the Jewish city to the left. I saw them, their garments still girded, sitting in threes by the basin in the forecourt of the school. The basin was surrounded by a little channel, in which they were washing their feet. Every three made use of a long brown towel to dry their feet. Jesus did not always allow his feet to be washed by others. Generally each one performed that service for himself. Here their coming had been looked for, and food was at once offered them. Jesus had here a great number of devoted adherents, and in their midst he taught for fully two hours. After that he had a long conference with the Roman governor, who presented to him two pagan youths desirous of instruction and baptism. They confessed their sins with tears, and Jesus pardoned them. Toward evening they were privately baptized by James in the forecourt of the doctor's dwelling. These youths were to follow the philosophers to Jesser. Mercuria also sent to beg Jesus to grant her an interview in the garden near the aqueduct. Jesus assented, and followed the servant that had delivered the message to the place designated. Mercuria came forward veiled, holding her two singularly dressed little girls by the hand. They wore only a short tunic down to the knee. The rest of their covering consisted of some kind of fine, transparent material upon which were wreaths of woolen or feather flowers. Their arms were bare, their feet enveloped in little bands, and their hair loose. They were dressed almost like the angels that we make for representations of the crib. Jesus spoke long and graciously with Mercuria. She wept bitterly and was very much troubled at the thought of having to leave her son behind her, also because her parents retained at a distance from her her younger sister who would thus remain in the blindness of paganism. She wept also over her own sins. Jesus consoled her and assured her again of pardon. The two little girls looked at their mother in surprise, and they too began to cry and to cling to her. Jesus blessed the little ones and went back to the school. Nason arrived from Kytrus accompanied by one of his brothers who wished to follow Jesus to Palestine. After a farewell repast, Jesus and his disciples went to the place where, by his orders, some of the Roman governor's people were awaiting them with asses. These they mounted. Jesus rode sidewise on a cross seat provided with a support, and by his side rode the governor. They passed the aqueducts and, at the rear of the city, crossed the little river Padius. They took a narrow country road shorter than the ordinary route, which wound in a curve near the shore. During the whole of that beautiful night, I saw the governor generally at Jesus' side. In front rode a troop of twelve, then came one of nine, followed by Jesus and the governor a little apart. Another band of twelve brought up the rear. Besides this occasion and Palm Sunday, I never saw Jesus otherwise than on foot. When morning began to break and they were still three hours from the sea, the governor, in order not to attract attention, bade adieu to Jesus. In parting Jesus presented to him his hand, and gave him his blessing. The governor had descended from his ass, for he wished to embrace Jesus' feet. Then he bowed low before him, withdrew a few steps, repeated his obeisance, it must have been a custom of the place, mounted his beast, and rode off. The two newly baptized pagans accompanied him. Jesus then rode until within about an hour of the place to which he was going, when he and his party dismounted and sent back the asses with the servants. They now journeyed on through the salt hills until they reached a long building where they found some mariners awaiting them. It was a quiet, solitary spot on the seashore. There were few trees around the country, but along the coast an extraordinarily long mound, or dike, covered with moss and trees. Facing the sea were dwelling houses and open buildings belonging to the salt works, in which poor Jewish families and some pagans dwelt. Farther on where the shore was steeper, there was a little cove down to which a flight of steps led, and here were anchored three ships in readiness for the travelers. It was easy to land at this spot, and it was from this point that the salt was shipped to the cities along the coast. Jesus was expected here, and all partook of a repast consisting of fish, honey, bread, and fruit. The water of this place was very bad, and they purified it by putting something into it, I think fruit. They kept it in jugs and leathern bottles. Seven of the Jews belonging to the ship's crew were here baptized, a basin being used for the ceremony. Jesus went from house to house, consoling the poor occupants, 
bestowing alms upon them, healing the wounded, and curing the sick, who stretched out their hands pitifully toward him. First he asked whether they believed that he could cure them, and upon their answering, Yes, Lord, we do believe, he restored them to health. He went even to the end of the long dike, also to the homes of the pagans, who met him looking timid and shy. Jesus blessed the poor children and gave some instructions. The disciple from Naim had lately arrived at this place, where he awaited two other disciples. They came in good time, and then all three set out for Palestine to announce Jesus' coming. Jesus' party counted twenty-seven men, all of whom embarked at evening twilight in three little vessels. That in which Jesus sailed was the smallest, and with him were four disciples and some rowers. Each of the vessels had in the center, rising around the mast, galleries divided into compartments which served as sleeping places. With the exception of the rowers, who took their stand above, no one of the ship's crew could be seen. I saw Jesus' little vessel sailing out ahead, and I wondered why the others took a different direction. But when it had grown quite dark, I saw them at about half an hour from the shore fastbound in two places, a torch raised on the mast as a sign of distress. At this sight, Jesus ordered his sailors to row back toward them. They approached one of the ships, threw out to it a rope, sailed round it, and with it thus in tow, went to the other and did the same. The two were in this way bound to Jesus' vessel, which now they followed. Jesus rebuked the disciples on the two ill-guided vessels for having thought themselves possessed of more knowledge of the way, spoke of self-will, and of the necessity of following him. The ships had gotten caught in an eddy between two sandbanks. On the evening of the following day, just before the entrance of the great gulf which the sea forms at the foot of Mount Carmel between Ptolemy and Hepha, I saw Jesus' three vessels rowing back again into deep water. For a little inside the gulf a struggle was going on between a large ship on one side and some smaller ones on the other. The large ship was victorious, and several dead bodies were thrown out into the water. As Jesus' vessels drew near the combatants, Jesus raised his hand and blessed them, whereupon they soon separated. They did not see Jesus' vessels, for the latter were awaiting the issue at some distance from the entrance to the gulf. The dispute between the two parties had arisen in Cyprus on the subject of the cargo. The little vessels had here lain in wait for the large one. The combatants hacked away and aimed at one another from the decks with long poles. One would have thought not a soul would escape. The struggle lasted a couple of hours. At last the large ship took the smaller ones prisoner, and moved slowly off with them in tow. Jesus landed near the mouth of the Sison, east of Hepha, which lies on the coast. He was received on shore by several of the apostles and disciples, among them Thomas, Simon, Thaddeus, Nathaniel Chaste, and Heliasim, all of whom were unspeakably delighted to embrace him and his companions. They went round the gulf for about three hours and a half, and crossed a little river that flows into the sea near Ptolemy. The long bridge across this river was like a walled street. It extended to the foot of the height behind which was the morass of Sendivia. Having climbed this height, they proceeded to the suburbs of the Levitical city Misael, which was separated from them by a curve of that same height. This suburb faced the sea on the west, and on the south rose Carmel with its beautiful valley. Misael consisted of only one street and one inn, which extended over the height. Here, near a fountain, Jesus was met by the people in festal procession, the children singing songs of welcome. All bore palm branches, on which the dates were still hanging. Simeon from Sichelibneth, the city of waters, was here with his whole family. After his baptism, he came to Misael, for his children gave him no rest until he had again joined the Jews. He had arranged this reception for Jesus, and all at his own expense. When the procession reached the inn, nine Levites from Misael came forward to salute Jesus. To the north of the suburb and on a declivity halfway up the height lay the beautiful pleasure garden of Misael, commanding a magnificent view of the gulf. Higher up on the hill one could see the pond, or morass, of Sendivia and Libneth, the city of waters, which was an hour and a half distant. It was nearer the sea, which here makes a bend into the land, than Misael, which was a couple of hours from the sea. Debeseth was five hours to the east of the Sison, and Nazareth about seven. Jesus walked in the garden with his disciples and related the parable of a fisherman that went out to sea to fish, 
and took 570 fishes. He told them that an experienced fisherman would put into pure water the good fish found in bad, that like Elias he would purify the springs and wells, that he would remove good fish from bad water, where the fish of prey would devour them, and that he would make for them new spawning ponds and better water. Jesus introduced into the parable also the accident that had happened on the sandbank to those that, out of self-will, had not followed the master of the vessels. The Cypriots who had followed Jesus could not restrain their tears when they heard him speak of the laborious task of transporting fish from bad to good water. Jesus mentioned clearly and precisely the number 570 good fish that had been saved, and said that that was indeed enough to pay for the labor. He spoke of Cyprus to the Levites, who rejoiced that Jews from that country were coming hither. Many were coming also from Ptolemy, and would pass this way. There was question of measures to be taken. Jesus spoke of the danger that threatened them there, whereupon the Levites asked anxiously whether the heathens of their country would ever become so powerful as to prove dangerous. Jesus answered by an allusion to the judgment that was to fall upon the whole country, the danger that threatened himself, and the chastisement that would overtake Jerusalem. His hearers were unable to comprehend how he could again return to Jerusalem but he said that he had still much to do before the consummation of his labors. The Syrophoenician from Ornithopolis sent hither by some of the disciples little golden bars and plates of the same metal chain together. She was desirous to send one of her ships to Cyprus, in order to facilitate Mercuria's flight from the island. On an invitation from the Levites, Jesus accompanied them to Misael, a very ancient city, surrounded by walls and towers, in the latter of which dwelt some pagans. Elizabeth had for a long time sojourned here with her father, who exercised the functions of a Levite, and Zachary too was once at Misael. Elizabeth was born in an isolated country housed two hours from Misael in the plain of Esdralon. The property belonged to her parents, and she afterward inherited it. In her fifth year she entered the temple. When she left it, she returned for a time to Misael and, after another period spent at the house in which she was born, she went to Zachary's home in Judea. Jesus spoke of her and of John. He insisted in terms so significant upon John's office of precursor of the Messiah that it was easy to guess who he himself was. While in the city, Jesus went with the Levites to visit and cure the sick of several families. Some of the invalids were children, and several of the adults were lame. They held out to Jesus their hands enveloped in linen bands. Jesus visited Simeon also in his own house, and then proceeded to the synagogue where he closed the Sabbath exercises. Here the women stood in a kind of high tribune not far from the chair of the teacher. Jesus' teaching turned upon sacrifice for sin and upon Samson. He rehearsed the principal deeds of the latter, and spoke of him as of a saint whose life was prophetic. Samson, Jesus said, did not lose all his strength, for he had retained sufficient to do penance. His overturning of the heathen temple upon himself was owing to a special inspiration from God. Judas, who loved to execute business commissions, and Thomas, whose family owned rafts in the port, and who was well known here, went with several disciples to Hepha to make arrangements for the expected Cypriots. Jesus meanwhile, with about ten of his disciples, among them Saturnin, went on to the Levitical city of Thanic, where he was received by the elders of the synagogue. The Pharisees here, though not open enemies of Jesus, yet were cunning and on the watch to catch him in his speech. I saw that by their own equivocal language. They said that he would undoubtedly visit their sick, and asked him whether he would extend that same charity to a man who had been in Capernaum, and who was now in a very suffering state. They thought that Jesus would refuse to see the latter, who had shown himself one of his bitterest opponents in Capernaum. His present sickness, a very singular one indeed, they supposed to be a punishment for his conduct on that occasion. He hiccuped and vomited continually, the upper part of his body was constantly convulsed, and he was visibly pining away. He was a man between thirty and forty, and had a wife and children. When Jesus went to see him, he asked him whether he believed that he could help him. The poor man, quite dejected and ashamed of his former conduct, answered, Yes, Lord, I do believe. Then Jesus laid one hand on his head and the other on his breast, prayed over him, and commanded him to rise and take some nourishment. The man arose, 
and with tears thanked Jesus, as did likewise his wife and children. Jesus addressed some gracious and comforting words to them, but made not the slightest allusion to the man's proceedings against himself. That evening when the Pharisees beheld the cured man appear in the synagogue, they completely renounced all desire to contradict Jesus in his speech. He taught of the accomplishment of the prophecies, of John the Baptist, the precursor of the Messiah, and of the Messiah himself. His words were so significant that his hearers might readily conclude that he was alluding to himself. From Thanuk, Jesus went to a carpenter shop, in which Joseph had first worked after his flight from Bethlehem. It was a building wherein fully a dozen people were engaged in the manufacture of wooden articles. They dwelt in little homes around the enclosure. The shop in which Joseph had worked was now occupied by the descendants of his master. They no longer worked at the business themselves, but employed poor people for that purpose. The goods, which consisted of thin planks, rods, graded screens, and lattice work, were principally exported on ships. The report was still current in this place that the prophet's father had once labored here, but they no longer knew distinctly whether it was Joseph of Nazareth or not. I thought at the time, if these people, after so short a lapse of time, know so little about these things, it is certainly not surprising that we too should know so little. Jesus delivered an instruction in the yard adjoining the workshop, taking for his subjects the love of labor and the thirst for gain. From Thanuk, Jesus went to Shaun, a horrible old place two hours west of Thaber. With its ancient citadel and synagogue, near which some Pharisees dwelt, it lay somewhat high. Below and far behind some ramparts on the banks of the Sison, was a group of houses whose locality was not very healthful. The ramparts were so high that one could not see over them. The occupants of these houses appeared to be dependents upon those above them, by whom they were oppressed and tormented. Jesus, in his instruction given in the synagogue, inveighed against the Pharisees who imposed upon others grievous burdens that they would not themselves touch, against the oppression of the neighbor, and the thirst after power. He spoke also of the Messiah who, he said, would be very different from what they expected. Jesus had gone to Shaun in order to console the poor, oppressed people. He visited their low, narrow, and obscure quarter of the city, and cured several poor sick in their huts, most of them gouty and paralyzed. The Pharisees banished all the sick to this miserable place, in which they could scarcely get a breath of fresh air. Jesus and the disciples gave the poor creatures presents of linen and strips of other materials. Jesus and the disciples went from this place to Naim in about an hour and a half. Several disciples and the youth of Naim whom Jesus had raised from the dead came to meet him near the well outside the city, so that Jesus had with him now about twelve disciples, though no apostles. The disciples belonging to Jerusalem had come hither from the holy city with some of the holy women, while others, having celebrated the feast of Pentecost with Mary at Nazareth, awaited at Naim on their return journey the coming of Jesus. He put up at an inn prepared for him at Naim in one of the houses belonging to the widow, whom he went to see shortly after his arrival. The female portion of the family came out veiled to meet him in the portico of the inner court, and cast themselves at his feet. Jesus saluted them graciously, and accompanied them into the reception hall. There were five women present besides the widow herself, namely, Martha, Magdalene, Veronica, Johanna Chusa, and the Siphonite. They, the holy women, sat apart at the end of the hall, on a kind of raised trestle like a long, low sofa. They sat cross-legged on cushions and rugs. The seat they occupied was raised high enough to show the feet upon which it rested. The women were silent until Jesus addressed them, and then each spoke in her turn. They related what was going on at Jerusalem, and told Jesus of the snares Herod had laid for him. They became so animated in their recital that Jesus raised his finger and reproached them with their worldly solicitude and their judgments of others. Then he told them all about Cyprus, of those whom he had won to the truth, and spoke in words of love of the Roman governor and Salamis. When the women expressed it as their opinion that it would be well if he too left the island, Jesus replied, No. He must stay there and render service to many souls until my own work shall be accomplished. Then another will succeed him, and he too will prove himself a friend of the community. Magdalene and the Siphonite were nothing like as beautiful as they used to be. They were pale and thin, 
and their eyes red from weeping. Martha was very energetic, and in business affairs very talkative. Johanna Chusa was a tall, pale, vigorous woman, grave in manner, but at the same time active. Veronica had in her deportment something very like St. Catherine. She was frank, resolute, and courageous. When the holy women were thus gathered together, they used to work industriously, sewing and preparing for the community all sorts of things, which were distributed among their private inns, or laid away in the storerooms. From these latter the apostles and disciples supplied their own needs, as well as those of the poor. When there was no special work of this kind to be done, the holy women spent their time in sewing for poor synagogues. They generally had with them their maidservants, who preceded or followed them on their journeys, and carried the various materials, sometimes in leathern pouches, sometimes attached to their girdle under their mantle. These maids wore tightly fitting bodices and short tunics. When the holy women were to remain some time at any place, their maids returned and awaited their coming at some of the inns along the route. Veronica's maid was with her a long time. She was in her service even after Jesus' death. When on the Sabbath Jesus repaired to the synagogue, he did not go to the teacher's chair, but stood with his disciples in the place in which traveling teachers were accustomed to stand. But after bidding him welcome and the prayers being said, the rabbis constrained him to take his place before the open rolls of scripture and to read therefrom. The Sabbath lesson treated of the Levites, the murmuring of the people, the quails sent by God, and the punishment that befell Miriam, and from the prophet Zacharias, some passages referring to the vocation of the Gentiles and to the Messiah. Jesus' words were severe. He said that the heathens would occupy in the Messiah's kingdom the places of the obdurate Jews. Of the Messiah, he said that they would not recognize him as such, for he would be totally different from what they expected. Among the Pharisees were three more insolent than the others. They had been on the commission at Capernaum. The cure of the Pharisee at Thanuk had vexed them exceedingly, and they said that Jesus had effected it merely that the Pharisees of that place might connive at his doings. They recommended him to be quiet and not to disturb the Sabbath with his cures. It would be just as well for him, they said, to go back whence he came and to forbear creating any excitement. Jesus replied that he would fulfill the duties of his mission, journeying and teaching until his hour had arrived. The Pharisees gave no entertainment to Jesus in Naim. They were full of spite against him, because his doctrine and charity drew after him all the poor, the miserable and the simple-hearted, whom their own severity alienated. The season about this time in Naim was indescribably delightful. Jesus took the Sabbath day's journey with the disciples, to whom he unfolded, in very earnest and confidential words, his own future. He exhorted them to remain true and faithful, for great sufferings and persecutions were in store for him. They should not, he said, be scandalized at him. He would not forsake them, either must they abandon him, although the treatment he would receive would put their faith to the proof. The disciples were touched to tears. They went to the garden of Moroni, the widow, where too came the holy women. Jesus told them about the reconciliation that had taken place among the married couples in Malop, and dwelt especially upon that between the couple with whom he had once taken a meal, and who had resolved to remove to Palestine. He spoke of Mercuria also, saying that she would first join the Syrophoenician, who was likewise making preparations to leave Ornithopolis. They would first go to Jesser, and thence proceed further on. Already many people had left Cyprus, and a certain number would soon land at Joppa. When Jesus left the garden with the disciples, in order to close the Sabbath in the synagogue, he found on his way several sick persons who had caused themselves to be carried there in litters. They stretched out their hands to him, imploring his help, and he cured them. And so he reached the synagogue whither also some others had had themselves conveyed on their beds. There was one man among them ill of the gout and terribly swollen, and there were others whom on his last journey Jesus had refused to cure because their faith was not pure. He had allowed them to continue in their sufferings that they might be brought at last to implore their cure more humbly. And now came the Pharisees, greatly incensed at Jesus curing these invalids, for they had spread the report that he was unable to do so. They set up a great hue and cry at what they called his desecration of the Sabbath. But Jesus went on with the cures until seven had been effected. Jesus answered the infuriated Pharisees sharply, 
asking them whether it was forbidden to do good on the Sabbath, whether they did not nourish themselves, take care of themselves, on the Sabbath day, whether the curing of these sick was not in itself a sanctification of the Sabbath day, whether they ought not on the Sabbath day to console the afflicted, whether they should on the Sabbath day retain possession of goods unjustly acquired, whether, on the Sabbath day, they should leave in their affliction the widows, the orphans, and the poor of whom they had oppressed and tormented during the whole week, and he upbraided them soundly for their hypocrisy and their oppression of the poor. He told them openly that, under the pretext of providing for the synagogue, which already had a superfluity of all that was necessary, they extorted the means of the poor, and in that same synagogue made the law for them a heavy burden. But not content with that, they would now cut them off from the grace of God on the Sabbath, prevent their receiving health on the Sabbath. While they themselves on the Sabbath feasted and drank upon what they had pitilessly wrung from them. By these words Jesus silenced the Pharisees, and all entered the synagogue. The Pharisees laid before Jesus the rolls of Scripture and invited him to teach. This they did craftily in the hope of being able to convict him of error and bring a charge against him. When, then, Jesus alluded to the era of the Messiah and said that numbers of pagans would come over to the people of God at that time, they asked him mockingly whether he had not gone himself to Cyprus in order to bring the pagans back with him. Jesus spoke likewise of the tithes of imposing burdens on others and not carrying them oneself, and of the oppression of orphans and widows, for from Pentecost till the Feast of Tabernacles the tithes were brought to the temple. But in places remote from Jerusalem, as this was, the Levites collected them. And here it was that abuses crept in, for the Pharisees extorted the tithes from the people and converted them to their own use. It was against this that Jesus invaded. The Pharisees were highly exasperated and on leaving the synagogue gave vent to their spleen. From Naim Jesus went with some of the disciples up the height this side of the Sison. Proceeding in a northeasterly direction, they arrived at Rimmon where there was a school under the charge of some Levites. These now came to the school to meet Jesus, who gave an instruction to the youths and little boys on an open square in front of the schoolhouse. Thither also flocked many of the people who had already listened to Jesus' teachings at Naim. He explained to the children the general duties imposed by the Mosaic law, but did not enlarge before them upon the dangers of the present time, as he was accustomed to do before his more elderly audiences. Rimmon consisted of a long row of houses on a slope of the mountain. The inhabitants were mostly gardeners and vinedressers who disposed of their fruits at Naim and worked also in the gardens of that place. From Rimmon, Jesus ascended the eastern side of Thaber. He was accompanied a good part of the way by the Levites who had been collecting the tithe offerings in Rimmon. After a journey of about three hours, he reached Beth Lechem, a place in ruins east of the city of Dabrath. It comprised only one row of houses occupied by poor peasants, whom Jesus visited in their homes, encouraging them in their miseries and healing their sick. Leaving Beth Lechem, he journeyed on for about four hours through the valley in which was the well of Capernaum and toward dusk arrived at Azanoth where he had a private inn. Here he found some friends from Capernaum awaiting him, Jarius and his daughter, the blind man of Capernaum to whom he had restored sight, the female relatives of Inuit, the woman healed of the bloody flux, and Leah, the woman who had cried out to him, Blessed is the womb that bore thee. The women, their veils down, fell on their knees before Jesus, and he blessed them. They shed tears of joy upon beholding him again. Jairus' daughter was well and full of life, and withal quite changed, for she was now devout and modest. Jesus taught until far into the night. On the following day he went to Dama, where he had outside the city a private and over which a relative of Joseph's family presided. Lazarus and two disciples belonging to Jerusalem were here waiting for him. Indeed, Lazarus had already been eight days in those parts attending to the real estate and land and houses of the Magdalene property for only the household goods and similar effects belonging to Magdalene had as yet been disposed of. Jesus embraced Lazarus, a favor he was accustomed to extend only to him and the elder apostles and disciples. To the others, he merely extended his hands. Jesus spoke of the Cypriots, those that had accompanied him and those that were to follow later, and made some remarks as to how they should be supported. I heard on this occasion that James the Less and Thaddeus were to proceed to Jesser, 
in order to receive and accompany the seven pagan philosophers who were to arrive there. Jesus treated Lazarus with marked confidence. On this occasion they walked alone together for a long time. Lazarus was a tall man, grave and gentle and very self-possessed in manner. Moderate in all things, even his familiar intercourse with others was stamped with a something that wore an air of distinction. His hair was black and he bore some resemblance to Joseph, though his features were sterner and more marked. Joseph's hair was yellow, and there was something uncommonly tender gentle and obliging in his whole deportment. From damned Jesus with Lazarus, the disciples, the steward of the inn along with his son who was soon to be admitted to the number of the disciples, went almost two hours eastward to the village belonging to the centurion Zorobabel of Capernaum. It was situated on the southern side of a rocky hill which shut in the valley of Capernaum on the south, and upon which lay the centurion's gardens and vineyards. Here Jesus instructed the servants and field laborers. He took for his text the Messiah and the near coming of his kingdom, announced to them the signs enumerated by the prophets, and showed how they had all been fulfilled, warned and implored them to amend their lives, and assured them that the Messiah would not appear under the form expected by the Jews, consequently only the small number of the humble and contrite would recognize him. He told them too that the Messiah would make known his doctrines by the lips of more than one, as he had formerly spoken through the mouth of many prophets. Some melancholy and possessed mutes were brought to Jesus. He laid his finger moistened with spittle under their tongues, and commanded Satan to depart, whereupon I saw some of them fall unconscious and then rise up cured, while others fell into convulsions for a short time, after which they too were restored to perfect health. All praised God and gave thanks for their cure. After that, Jesus, taking a solitary route, went to his mother's in the valley east of Capernaum, a distance of about three-quarters of an hour. The holy women were already with the Blessed Virgin, they having come from Naim by the direct road. They did not leave the house to receive Jesus, either did Mary hurry out to meet her son. After he had washed and let down his robe, Jesus entered the large apartment, in which several little alcoves were cut off by curtains. Mary, her head veiled and humbly inclined, stretched out to him her hand when he had first proffered his, and he graciously, though gravely, saluted her. The other women stood veiled, forming a semicircle in the rear. I have indeed seen Jesus when alone with Mary, in order to console and strengthen her, press her to his breast while conversing with her. But Mary herself, since his going forth to teach, treated him as one would treat a saint, a prophet, or as a mother might treat her son were he a pope, a bishop, or a king. Still, there was something much more noble, more holy in Mary's demeanor, though marked at the same time with indescribable simplicity. She never embraced him now, but only extended her hand when he offered his. Some time after, I saw Jesus and Mary eating together alone. A little, low table stood between them. Jesus reclined at one side, and Mary sat at the other. On it was a fish, some bread, honey, cakes, and two little jugs. The other holy women were in the little curtained alcoves in groups of two or three, or in a side hall serving the repast of the disciples, among whom they had several relatives. Jesus told his mother about Cyprus and the souls he had there gained. She expressed her joy quietly, but asked few questions. Her words were chiefly those of maternal solicitude touching the dangers that awaited him. Jesus replied gently that he would fulfill his mission until the hour came for his return to his father. Prayer for the Intercession of Blessed and Catherine Emmerich O oh, Blessed and Catherine Emmerich, devout and pious follower of Christ, who patiently endured the frailty of this mortal condition, who humbly received the honorable marks of Christ Jesus on your hands, feet, side, head, and chest, the marks which you were blessed by the Lord to witness for yourself in his own sufferings, we graciously ask for your intercession with God, that we sinners may be forgiven of our sins and be drawn more completely into spiritual communion with Christ our Lord. We ask this in the name of the Most Holy Lamb of God and through the intercession of Holy Mary, our Mother. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Blessed and Catherine Emmerich, pray for us.